Well, good morning. I guess I'm your liturgist, Kim Fisher. So I want to welcome everyone here at the United Methodist Church, and those on WGCY and those watching on Facebook or whatever the internet is. Uh, okay, Gary, I don't know how to become a doctor, so. Oh, okay, thanks. Uh, announcements, well, let's see. They're in your bulletin. And I don't have my glasses, so I'm not going to read them to you. <clears throat> so hopefully. <laughs> oh, thanks, Gary. <laughs> They're pretty, too. Huh? Okay. Okay, well, let's see. The summer Sunday school will start today. All right. And uh, they'll have snacks down there for the kids and any grown-ups that want to go st steal a cookie or two from the children. And I know you've seen the summer office hours. Uh, if you'd like to be a greeter, notify the uh, office. And it looks like we have a blood drive coming up at the American Lutheran Church on Tuesday, July 5th from 1 to 6. Now, are we ready to praise and worship God? Oh. About the motorcycle, the and the bike. oh, okay. Well, you bless the bikes. Uh, I turn my microphone on if that helps who's ever up there. We are going to have a blessing of the bikes, and I learned that uh, Becky, you guys used to have a blessing of the bikes here. And yeah, that's so cool. If I'd have known that, we would have put a purpose behind it, except to go get ice cream. I mean, that's a purpose in and of itself. But anyone is welcome, and if they're listening on GCY, tell your grandkids, or if you still ride a bike, I will bless anything that rolls into the parking lot. But if you are manually operating that machine, it's a long way to go to Sydney, and I don't think you'll keep up. So we're saying motorcycles, trikes, that's, that's a motorcycle with three wheels. Tom's got one of those. Anyway... We're going to ride down to Sydney and have ice cream, okay? But if you want to bless, a blessing laid upon you and your bike, bring it to the parking lot at 2 o'clock. Uh, you'll get a sticker and a $100 bill. So we ought to have a pretty good crowd. I'm kidding about one of those, and you can guess which one it is. <laughs> okay, now are we ready to praise and worship God? Please stand for the call to worship. Please join me. Dear God, please forgive us for all the things we have done wrong as we turn to you and a turn away from our sin. And now we'll have a moment of silence asking forgiveness for anything that you know that is keeping you away from God. center of my life, I welcome you personally as Lord and Savior of my life. I ask you, Holy Spirit, 
to fill me and empower me to live as God, child of God. I want to have your grace to truly live in a new life. Sorry about that. I bring my prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Very good. Now uh, we'll have our opening hymn, I Surrender All. Please re remain standing. Uh, we're going to skip the kids' sermon this morning and go right into the scripture reading, which is Luke 9, 51 through 62. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. 
the word of God for the people of God. Special music by Merle McAllister. I am thankful to be singing to a forgiving congregation today. When we're done, Gary's going to ask you a question because I'm not going to give you the title for the song I'm going to sing. It was December 4th, 1956. Carl Perkins had just uh, retired to sing and record at the Sun Records studio in Memphis, Tennessee. This was following the release of a song called Blue Suede Shoes. <laughs> by chance, three other Sun associates happened by the studio that day. Their names were Elvis Presley, Jerry Lee Lewis and Johnny Cash. An impromptu jam session evolved when the four met that day. Carl Perkins, uh, engineer, sound engineer, left all the mics on and recorded at least 47 tracks that day, two of which were written by Cleavon Derricks. You may be familiar with one of his songs, which is Have a Little Talk with Jesus. I'm going to sing the lesser known hymn that he wrote. Both of these are, were published in what they call the Red Back Shape Note Hymnal in 1951. So wait for Gary's question. Uh, when I'm done. When God dips his pen of love in my heart and he writes my soul a message he wants me to know his spirit all divine fills this sinful soul of mine when God dips his love in my heart well i said i wouldn't tell it to a living soul how he brought salvation and he made me whole but i found i couldn't hide such love as jesus did impart well he made me laugh and he made me cry set my sinful soul on fire when god dips his love in my heart well, sometimes, though the way is dreary, dark, and cold, and some unburdened sorrow keeps me from the goal, I go to God in prayer. I can always find Him there. When He whispers sweet peace to my soul, well, I said I wouldn't tell it to a living soul How he brought salvation and he made me whole But I found I couldn't hide such love as Jesus did impart Well, he made me laugh and he made me cry Set my sinful soul on fire When God dips his love in my heart he walked up every step of Calvary's rugged way And he gave his life completely to give a better day My life was steeped in sin 
But in love he took me in His blood washed away every stain And I said I wouldn't tell it to a living soul How he brought salvation and he made me whole But I found I couldn't hide such love as Jesus did impart He made me laugh and he made me cry Set my sinful soul on fire When God dips his love His sweet love In my heart Now we get to play a game who wants to play? Come on, get excited. Oh, I want to play a game. Okay, the, the name of the game is Name That Tune. Who can name that tune? Oh, we have someone. Is that Mel? Mel, stand up. Name that tune. Is she correct? Wow, ding, 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 Mel one. Oh yeah! <laughs> now how did you know that? Oh, she sung the tune before. Well, Merle, somehow I've envisioned you standing in the middle of the studio at Sun Studios, right along with those four other fellas just singing. Could you imagine what that day would have been like when those they were young then, you know, and just for them to walk in, and I know the spirit had hold of them, just the music that came out of that era, but it's the devil's music, I just want to let you know, okay, <laughs> thanks Merle, let's give him another hand. <laughs> My message today is no if and buts or maybes. How many of you heard that before? How many of you live by that? No if and buts or maybes. That's a definitive statement. I find it a little, com uh, uh, just a little comedic relief when I think about no if ands, buts or maybes. It's the requirement, what makes me laugh when I think of requirements the thing that makes me laugh the hardest is all that we require of one another to be qualified. <laughs> what are you qualified for? Well, if it were a job interview and you went in, they would say, are you qualified for this job? And what is expected? Well, you're expected to pony up and prove that you can do it. Whew. How to become a doctor. Fish, this is where you were, okay? Step one, complete an undergraduate degree. Step two, pass the MCAT examination, okay? Number three, apply to medical school. Complete training at a medical school. Step five, pass parts one and two of the United States Medical Licensing Examination. Step six, <clears throat> match that with residency. Step seven, graduate from medical school and start residency. Step eight, pass all the parts of the United States Medical Licensing Examination and final a finish your residency. Step nine, you have to earn board certification. Step 10, get a state license, and then you get to apply for a job. Woohoo! Wow. Many of you remember Greg DeLost. <laughs> uh, we were sitting around one evening, and I, I said to him, that's when they first came to town, well, where'd you go to medical school? And he said, I went to Mexico. And I got real quiet. 
He says, that's a reaction I get from most people. They asked me if I practice on animals down there. And we laughed, and he said to me this, hey, what do you call a medical doctor that gets C's in medical school? <laughs> doctor. <laughs> That's, um, he got his work done. Okay. How about to be an elder in the United Methodist Church? Book of Discipline, that's our rule book, says that uh, elders are ministers who have completed their formal preparation for ministry of word, sacrament, and order, have been elected, this is the one that people, to be itinerant, saying, wherever you need me, God, I'll go. And to be in full connection with an annual conference. Ours happens to be the Illinois Great Rivers Conference and have been ordained elders in accordance with the order of discipline out of the book of discipline. In most cases, United Methodist elders must have a graduate with at least the very least a Bachelor of Arts degrees and just liberal education, that's the only thing in four years that's required. You don't have to specialize in Bible or anything. Just get a degree. And that degree has to come from an accredited, that's what you said, Rob, an accredited, recognized organization. And then after that, you apply to seminary. You all know I like to call that cemetery because all we do is get buried in it, all right? And then once you have a, a Masters of Divinity, you get passed to the Board of Ordained Ministry and you have to go through the requirements of the church. So this is, I, I added this up, yeah, I can do math once in a while. The process for that outside you know usually your undergraduate takes four years you know and then you go to the master's program and it can be four to six years a master's of divinity depending how aggressive someone wants to get well I wanted to kick the dirt off of me early I did it in three and a half years not because I'm smart I just didn't want to be there very long and then after that you have up to eight years to meet those requirements of what the Methodist Church gives you saying you have to get through the board in this amount of time and uh, there are extensions some people have taken two or three extensions but a Methodist preacher standing here could have as much as 17 years to do this job so and uh, you know I come into uh, PPRC staff first time we sat in the red room and nobody asked to see my credentials not one Marcia nobody asked well let's see your degrees let's see no nah, no nah, we talked about how we're gonna love Jesus that was the most important thing I said all that to get to this point I believe there are two jobs that God has placed before us, humankind, all of us, that are the very, very, very most important jobs. And I want to offer this up for your consideration. Just let me throw this out there. I see these two as life-changing. Completely life-changing. They should be at the top of our list when considering the importance of what life is about. <laughs> the first one I want to talk about is, uh, Sarah, this is going to resonate with you, uh, giving birth and being a parent. Huh? Huh? I think that's the number one. I put it number one anyway. Uh, think about it. There isn't any training required to be a parent. No schools no official handbook, no owner's manual 
Uh, unless that's changed. When you guys left the hospital, did they give you an owner's manual? Said uh, it changes oil or anything? No, okay, it hadn't changed. You have to meet all the qualifications in order to become a parent, and what are the qualifications? I don't ever remember being taught how to change a diaper. Anybody? This is how you change a diaper. Has Josh learned that? Oh, I would think so, my gosh. Uh, you know, to comfort a child when they come to you, when they're afraid, when they're sick, uh, when they have questions. And how many kids have a billion questions? All of them, right? I don't remember saying that you had to take a class in first aid so you could be there when he or she crashed their bike and ended up with rocks under their skin. I don't remember anything about that in parenthood. And in spite of our inadequacies, it is by God's grace and God's grace alone that kids still make it to adulthood. What I'm saying is, in spite of us, they still grow up. And new babies are being born all the time. And the church says, oh, I feel, I just feel the fire in that. I, we're excited this morning. <laughs> I put this as number one because many times the birth of a, of a child is often just repercussions of human inhibitions. I tried to say that as nicely as I could. When I grew up, it would have translated into a Friday night at the drive-in theater with your date. <laughs> Let's face it, folks. There ain't no putting a kid back. Once a kid gets here, they're here, right? It's real. Phil, I told you we were talking about this a little bit yesterday. Um, when a baby's born, a baby is born for real, forever. <laughs> now, accepting to be a parent isn't often the case, and that's another sermon for another day, okay? The second thing is really a stepping up personal moment. And this is when we answer the invitation to accept Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. That's the second thing. And you know what? There's, there's no manual for this except the Bible. And face it, folks, people aren't reading the Bible like they should. Amen. Okay, I'll quit beating people up. So really, Jesus is saying there's no if, and, buts, or maybes when it comes to being a Christian. What really messes with me is, we try to apply those premises and concepts to our Christian responsibilities. You may want to pull your feet back a little bit. I'm going to step on some toes intentionally here. I just want the people, if we are on the radio, I'm not sure we are today, but we're on Facebook. If you're going to be watching this, we have a whole bunch of empty pews right here today that I want to invite you to come and claim one of them. Yeah, if you want to bring a sticker and put your name on it, go ahead, I'll let you, okay? I think there's enough seats here for, what would you guess? Another 150 or 200 people. Your Christian commitment. What are we called to do? Jesus says there's no if, and, buts, or maybes. And as they were walking along the road, a man said to them, I will follow you wherever you go. Had a conversion experience. You remember what it was like? Methodists are tough at this. We aren't really 
profession of faith statement makers. Oh, we stepped out a little bit last week. Some, some of you came up and touched the water. That is a public statement of affirmation of my faith. To walk up and put your hand in the water when I said, remember, remember your baptism and be thankful. And Jesus replied, foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. I think as a statement to, do you really know what you're getting into? That first one points to the itineracy of a United Methodist elder in this church. No matter where you go, will you serve? No matter what you do, will you love? No matter if you have a roof over your head, will you still do it? And there are preachers that are still asked to take appointments, and they go and they look at a parsonage for the first time, they'll say, oh, I can't live here, or this has to be done. I think that's what that's pointing to today for us. He said to another man, follow me, but he replied, Lord, first, first, but first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus says to him, this is, let the dead bury the dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Mm. Do you think he followed? Do you think he went and buried his dad? Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye because I am so deeply loved, no one else will be able to take another step forward if I don't tell them goodbye. Hey, folks, none of us are that important. When it comes to following Jesus, go ahead and leave. Uh, we'll find you if we want to, okay? I incidentally, as an itinerant pastor... I don't know anybody who, if they really want to find me, can't find me. Because we as pastors are really good if we get letters or mail. We forward it on or deliver it by hand. Hmm. And finally, Jesus replied, no one can put a hand to the plow. I think he's talking to us right here in the Midwest. No one can put their hand to a plow and look back if you're going to be part of this kingdom work. Put the plow in the ground and keep moving forward, bringing the love and the life of Jesus Christ to all the people we find. And I love to do that in my life. You all know it, no matter where I am. I've got a little story to add. It's not part of this, but I'll say it like this. Uh, last night, we were playing up at Thawville at that new brewery. It's called Artesian. It's kind of over by 57 on east of Thawville. And there were some people we know there from the Loda United Methodist Church. And just for fun, we say this, uh, the more you drink, the better we sound, so everybody have another round. So this guy came in to me and said, hey, do you say that in church on Sunday? And I said, well, we aren't talking necessarily about alcohol. And straighten your halo. Put that beer down. <laughs> you know, we are who we are. And God says, follow me. I want you like you are. Be who you are because you're going to reach people that no one else can. So... If you want to be a Christian, put everything else down. No if, and, buts, or maybes, and follow me. And that's the question today. Karen, are you back? Uh, well, this was my part where I was going to ask Karen to introduce our guests this morning. But Rob, come on up here and I, I tell you what, I'll try my very best. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as a candidate for the President of the United States, would you, oh, no, no, <laughs> ah, just kidding you. 
But Rob comes to us from across the drink. Is that safe? Sure. Yeah. But it's pretty dry where you are? It is. It is huh? Uh, name the country where you think Rob's living and his lovely wife. I don't want to leave her out of it. Uh, it's really near and dear to the United Methodist Church, this country. Uh, one of the countries where the love of Christ is growing at a just breakneck speed. Who can name the country? Oh, more hints. Okay. Uh, this country had a lot to do with slavery. They'll get that. Africa, there it came. Oh, you had your You just got to blurt it out because Chris beat you. Were you going to say Africa? Okay. Well, they live in Africa. And he is a missionary. They are a missionary family. And guess what? Part of our mission dollars goes to support their ministry. So get a $100 bill out. We're going to have a special offering right after this. Oh, no, no, we're not. But, uh, Rob, thanks for being, and I'm going to turn the microphone over to you. Well, I first want to say thank you. We have been on the mission field for 14 years, so going on 15, and you have supported us through the entire time. And without your support, we could not do it what we're doing and what we are doing is um, right now I have I I'm a superintendent of a series of schools in Senegal West Africa and we're expanding and so uh, we have um, schoolhouses now in Guinea and in Liberia and our purpose and mission is one to provide an, a place for education for missionary kids so one of the biggest barriers for people going and doing missions is education they won't go to the field unless they can educate their kids so some homeschool uh, but many don't have that gift or want a more robust education for their kids, uh, so they want a school to go in. And uh, the traditional model would used to be where they would send, uh, missionaries would send their kids to a boarding school to board um, in, in a region, like so West Africa would have one main missionary school and they would send their kids away to that. Well, boarding is no longer, most parents don't feel comfortable sending their kids away. So we are in the process of building schools in every major city in West Africa so that missionaries can serve wherever they feel called to serve. And additionally, we found that to do that well, we need to invite the communities we're part of in. So we're inviting the business community, the embassy community, the United Nations community in to serve with us. And the neat part about that, I'm located in a country that's 90 per Senegal, Senegal, where we are located, is 90% Muslim. And as we have them into our school and they fall in love with Jesus, um, we, we find about a, a good portion of those will give their lives to Christ if they come to us at elementary school. And I want to tell you one story of how that happens. Um, recently, um, several our PE teacher got together with our health teacher, and they wanted to demonstrate, you know, the price that Christ had to pay uh, for us. And so they gave out, they were going to give out a cupcake to every student. There were 31 kids in the class. And they said, we're going to give you a cupcake. But to give you that cupcake, our PE teacher has to do 10 push-ups. <laughs> and so for every cupcake he, they gave out, he would do 10 push-ups. Well, there were 31 kids in the class. So he did and ended up doing 310 push-ups. All at one time? All at one time. Whoa! Without, I mean, you know, there was, yeah. No break in between. He did, he did the, the, and so by the time he gets the last 30, 40 push-ups, they could see the pain, they could see the sweat, and see they would hand out the cupcake right after he got done with 10. So every 10, they would give a cupcake. And the point was the price that had to be paid for the cupcake. And of course, they made it that, that same point of how much Christ, infinitely more, Christ had to pay to give us grace. And that grace, what, what a lot of students wrote after that, ex that, that experiment took place is for the first time we see the price Christ had to pay for our sins, that it was costly, that it wasn't cheap. In fact, a Muslim student said, I never knew grace cost so much. And so that's the, why we exist, is we exist to tell people about Jesus, and we think education is one of the best ways to do that. When people go to a school and they're loved by the teacher and the teacher loves Jesus, the student loves Jesus. And uh, we see that all the time where our students, because the teacher loves Jesus, they start falling in love with Jesus. And one last story, and then 
um, I'll leave you. We, we had uh, the Omani, we, we served the, like I said, embassy kids, and we had the Omani ambassador come in, and he was saying, um, I want to send my kid to your school. You have a good, uh, we had a special needs program, and his, and his son was special needs, and he says, I want to send my kid, but you got to promise me you won't tell our son about Jesus. I said, well, that's why we exist. So if you want to send your kid to our school, we're, gonna, we're a Christian school. Well, he reluctantly sent his kid to our school and about two years later he comes in and he says i have a major problem your school's wonderful i couldn't ask for more the teachers really care for my son he's really making progress like they've never seen before but he's telling me he loves jesus and he says i'm going to pull him from our school unless you stop that right now and i said no we exist to be a christian school so he pulled his kid and went to another school and two weeks he comes back and he said my wife said i had to bring my son back because there's no one who loves our son like your school does. And see, love is our strongest apologetic. We realize that when we treat kids well, when we love them well, when we show them grace that they haven't experienced, when we show them their worth isn't just based on their grades or their sports performance or how they, well they do on the basketball field, the soccer field, and they see that we love them because we love Jesus, then they start falling in love with Jesus too. And that's our goal, and that's our purpose, and we've seen a lot of people, a lot of fruit, and that's our hope is to continue to expand that. So right now we have three schools in Dakar, Senegal, as I said, and we have what are called cooperative campuses. These are one-room schoolhouses uh, serving missionaries in, in more harder-to-reach places in Guinea and Liberia. And so and our hope is to continue to expand that. And all that's possible because of you. So I want to say a huge thank you uh, because we wouldn't be doing that work without you. So thank you so much. Thank you. How many of you have met Rob before? Raise your hands. Let's just see. Okay. If you want to know he, who he is and you don't, ask the person sitting next to you because I think it was just about at least someone sitting right next to you knows him. Uh, he's a product, a product of Gibson City. Went to school here. Uh, has classmates. Has friends here. Uh, he's part of us. But he's in Africa changing the world. I think that's cool, don't you? So we do two major we do two major collections. One is a march to the manger, and that whole offering that we do goes towards our missionaries. And the other one happens at Easter, right? And it, you call it, come on, yeah, parade of palms. And that whole offering goes into the missionary fund. But what I want to do is invite you, though, if, if this helps you put a face to the work we do with our mission money, I, I think it's really important. And so whenever you're in the area, come and share a story or two. Uh, he took the whole service last night. He was on a roll. We had questions and answers. I don't think you were ready for some of those, but it's all right. I, I'm not apologizing. We're just trying to get to know you. But once again, anytime, just mark. And if you want to personally mark it for him, that's okay. We'll get it to him. All right. They have a wonderful mission because we are a mission-driven church. Amen. Let's give God the praise and glory. Come on. Our prayer time begins with uh, Joyce came in this morning to me and said I could share this. You know, many of you know her grandson Miles. Miles was hit by a car and is down in the hospital at Carl right now facing procedures to mend him back together. And so I would ask you to keep in your prayer Miles and his entire family. Also, the individual that was involved in the accident, I know so many times we need to pray for the whole situation. So let's give that to God this morning. I have permission to share that uh, uh, Chris had told me that she was going to have to take care of Jim by putting his IVs in. It takes uh, 
probably the better part of an afternoon or morning to get the IVs to go in. But in order for them to go home, there had to be someone who could do it, and she's qualified. So, Jim, I, know, I hope you're listening, and maybe if not, you watch on Facebook. Our prayers today go up for you as well for health and healing. They had to reopen where his knee replacement was and uh, clean everything out, but we're hoping he's on the road to recovery. Amen, people. Yeah, I, I don't ask for prayer concerns here. Uh, we have too much open media, and I don't want to put anyone on the spot, uh, unless it would be Jeff. I don't mind putting him on the spot, so yeah. All, all right. But I have to mention, uh, we celebrate good things that go on, and yesterday, thank you to everyone who came and helped spiffy up the place. We had tons of help. Uh, Abigail was our youngest. I'm not going to say who our oldest was. I will say Abigail dug right in with all of us. And if you get a chance and you haven't driven by the parsonage, just take a little drive there, okay? That's all I'm going to say. I don't want to be a spoiler. So that's a joy, right? Let's give a nice round of applause to the people who showed up and worked yesterday. Yeah. And those of you who weren't here, you're just saying, oh, he's making us feel bad. Oh, no, I'm just inviting you to the next one, okay? So, what a wonderful thing it is to be called church. So turn to the people to your right and your left, in front of you and back of you. Just take a minute and remind them of the most important thing we can tell one another. God loves you. As we center in, I'm going to ask Bev to play a little song to help us center in our prayer, and we'll continue with a pastoral prayer ending with the Lord's Prayer. Let's be in prayer. Good morning, God. Thank you for this moment. In all reality, we are imperfect people living in an imperfect world who have been shown perfection. That perfection comes in the form of love. What Rob was talking about, the reason that we are able to make a difference is because of Christ's love in us. And he's the one that has shown us complete love because of what you've given him. God, let a lot of that rub off on us, for we are in a hurting and broken world. And the past week has shown us through court decisions here in the United States that there is much work to do and you just have to turn on the TV or look at a news clip for a very short time to see that we are a divided country. And it ranges not only from birth issues to safety issues. 
And we can sure mess things up, God. And we need your help to put it back together. No if, and, buts, or maybes. We need to love you more deeply. Follow you more closely. And listen to your voice so clarity can come through and show us our way. That your way will be the world. I lift up the folks that we have prayers for, the ones that uh, I spoke their names out loud, but I know there are people in here who are dealing with medical issues, dealing with new financial issues that this week has introduced them to. I know there are family issues, and I know that the way that we will be able to come together is by bringing you to the forefront. So I pray that in all the lives of everyone who is struggling today, that the first thing we do instead of thinking about how bad it is, realizing how good it is because you are in us. And when we center and place everything at the foot of your cross, you show us ways to manage and to manage and overcome. And I thank you that you are our God of love, giving us hope and allowing us to know peace. There's a prayer that unites us all, each and every one, all around the world. And this morning we come and we share it openly as we listen to one another and we give our hearts to you when we pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'd love to invite the ushers to run up here. Oh, I don't think that's going to happen.
the offering for us. Do you, would you do that, please, sir? Thank you. Oh, man, thank you. I thought you could do it. <laughs> well, you ready to sing? I mean, we don't have to. I, it's up to you all. I'm trying to get you cranking. We had over an inch of rain. Somebody should be going, woohoo! Yeah. I asked Merle. I said, Merle was at a million-dollar rain, and Merle says, much more. <laughs> so let's celebrate by singing. Oh, I love this song. Sing it like you know it, and if you don't, sing louder.
God's people say, Thank you. 